Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast, season two. I'm Emma Morris, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Yvonne Hartley. Hi, Yvonne. Hey, Emma. Lovely to be here. Great. So we're here today to answer some more of people's frequently asked questions. And we'll begin today with a question we're asked quite commonly. Um, Jeremy drugged Sheila and forced her to walk over the body of her dead mother before he shot her. That's not true at all. Uh, firstly, I must say that it is an issue that has been raised is how on earth could Jeremy have persuaded Sheila to step over her mother who was in the doorway? It's impossible. I mean, anybody would react in mm. a negative way to that. I mean, the, the sight of your mother deceased on the floor is going to be horrific. Yeah, definitely. You know, she's not going to calmly step over and do as she's told. And Sheila wasn't drugged. When they did analysis of Sheila's blood and toxicology results, samples taken at the post-mortem, she had no drugs in her system. There was a trace of cannabis, which mm. had been there from the previous weekend uh, when she'd been at Collins' party. There was also a small trace of heloperidol, and that was it. Right. So what is he supposed to have drugged her with? There, yeah. uh, there was no blood alcohol level. There was, there was nothing. So... It feels like a lot like people just have to get around a problem and make, oh, 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 oh it must have been, it must have drugged her. With no basis in reality or truth whatsoever. No, but it's the only way people can probably make sense of. But as well, how would Jeremy get Sheila to lie down calmly on the floor to shoot her? Apparently twice. It's not going to happen. It's not realistic for if people to even propose that. So he supposedly made her walk out of her bedroom, along the hallway, over the body of her dead mother and not do anything about it, calmly walk to the other side of the bed, lie down on the floor and be shot. It's just not realistic. And it didn't happen. No. No, the only explanation is that Sheila did, as, as we say, shot herself in a state of psychosis. Exactly. And she'd have been fully aware that the body of her mother was in the doorway because that's where she was when she shot her. Yeah, exactly. Okay, another question we see quite a lot is that Jeremy's story that a gun would be left out on the settle can't be correct, as never would have put it away in the gun cupboard as he was meticulous with gun safety. What about that? Yep, that has been put forward. That was asserted by the relatives uh, to the police and the evidence was actually used at trial about Neville being meticulous. So every time a weapon was used or left out, it would be put away by him in the gun cupboard. That is not true at all. There is no truth to that because uh, Neville Bamber wasn't meticulous with gun safety. So firstly, the gun cupboard as such was just an area under the stairs which had a ball catch on. There was no locking mechanism on it to begin with. So that's one aspect. But secondly, the relatives themselves admitted the guns were all over the house once they got the keys to the property on the 9th of August. So I can read you the actual list that Anne Eaton provided. And that was that there's a list of eight weapons, so it's one, Uncle Neville's 12 boy in Lesser's gun case, 0.410 on the back stairs, loose, no case, an air gun on the back stairs, loose, no case, Anthony Partridge's gun in the loo, a Webley and Scott 12 boy shotgun, a Meteor 0.22 air gun, a Webley and Scott single bolt action 0.410 shotgun, and a greener double barrel ejected 12 ball shotgun. Only one of those rifles was still in the gun cupboard when the police had been in the house on the 7th of August. And that's Anthony's rifle, 0.22 rifle, which is actually in his gun case in that gun cupboard. The rest of the weapons were all over the house. So as Annie and Clive had herself, there were some on the loo, some on the stairs, 
and others she's not specific where they were but they were definitely not in the gun cupboard so the jury were told that Neville was meticulous with gun safety because that's what the extended family presumably Anne and co said at that point said at that point that's what they said to the police in 1985 but when Anne actually revealed all the different weapons had taken from the house and the location where some of them were on the stairs and in the loo that wasn't until 1991 and of course we didn't know this evidence until 2011 when we had the documentation disclosed that's astounding isn't it it is because it's complete perjury i mean they knew that these items were taken from all over the house these these weapons and yet at the trial Neville's meticulous with gun safety and everything would be put in the cupboard. Well, obviously not. And they knew that they weren't because presumably, like you say, this list was made on the 9th of August. So they... they... No, the list, the list of where the weapons were was in 1991. But, but the... the scene of crime photographs showed that those weapons weren't in the gun cupboard. Oh, I see. And other photographs that remain undisclosed, we have no photographs of the toilet in which Anthony was supposed to have guns there. There was no photographs showing guns on the stairs. Where are those photographs? Because why are Essex police, again, trying to deceive the public and deceive the jury? Because there were guns all over the house, but yet they've hidden those photographs that confirm that that would be the case. They needed the jury to think that Neville would not have left a gun out, would not, Jeremy would not have left a gun on the settle because Neville would have put it away. And it's been completely untrue. Completely untrue. It's like the fabrication that um, the police say that Jeremy told them he left the gun on the table. He didn't leave it on the table in the kitchen. He never said that. He's always maintained from the beginning he left the gun on the settle which is in a hallway adjacent to the kitchen. You had to come through a door to get into the kitchen. But as his police officers, Stan Jones in particular, said it, that Jeremy had told him it was on the ta kitchen table. It wasn't. He left it on the... So he, he'd come in, left it just on the settle inside the, the door then and just carried on with his... Inside the back door. The settle was in a hallway that he entered. When he came into the back door, the kitchen door then was on your right-hand side. And people were a lot more relaxed, weren't they, in 1985 around, especially farmers and, you know, people living the rural life in terms of leaving guns. Yeah, it's unthinkable now that that's how it would be. But yeah. that, that, what, that's how it was, I'm guessing, right up until the, um, the Dunblane massacre. Even, even the fact that the cupboard wasn't locked gun cupboard basically it was just a little cupboard under the stairs yeah i know it's, it was the, I know it's yeah lots, yeah you know it's not exactly the most secure place anyway is it i remember those old sort of yeah cupboards under the stairs yeah so yeah. you know it wasn't a factor that should have even been factored in i mean the jury saw the photographs of the gun cupboard but nobody questioned well wait a minute where did all these guns come from that were supposed to be in the house Jeremy listed what weapons were in the house to the police. And yet the defence failed to bring up at trial, well, wait a minute, on that day, Jeremy listed what guns and ammunition should be in that property. But yeah, it wasn't yeah. until 1991 when I and actually disclosed what she removed. But she lied in court. Exactly. Um, well, that clears that one up for me. It's just another completely incorrect assumption, isn't it? It certainly is. Okay, so the next question we have is, what possible motive could the police have to frame Jeremy? That's an excellent question. And I think at first, on 7th of August 1985, they had no intention of framing Jeremy. It was a murder-suicide. They, they knew it was a murder-suicide. The evidence showed that, and the police at the scene knew that that was the case. A lot of the police had seen Sheila alive in the house. Yeah. So that they knew they knew it was a murder-suicide. But I think over the course of time, I think it started the very next day with Annie Eaton going into the police station and saying Sheila couldn't possibly have done this. That 
the listeners at that time, one of the officers, D.S. Jones, who didn't like the attitude of Jeremy at the scene. Yeah. And took an instant dislike to him and they had a few words at the scene. And I think Anne Eaton's theories fed into Jones's attitude of, oh, well, actually, I might be right here that there's more to this. Uh, and even though the, there's no supportive evidence, he started looking at Jeremy in a suspicious way. And of course, the police at the scene had made a lot of mistakes. They'd interfered with the crime scene. We didn't know at the time, but since disclosure in 2011, it's become evident that the whole case against Jeremy was instigated by very few officers. We know that, that the crime scene was interfered with, all that was withheld from the defence, the extent of that. We know they moved a lot of things in the house. We know now that they were responsible for one of the gunshot injuries that she only received. Yeah. And, of course, then the pressure on the police to get this right. You've got Taff Jones, who's, this is a murder-suicide. You've got Stan Jones, who's, well, I don't think it is, and I'm looking for anything to arrest Bam before. Which yeah, let's common. not let's not forget. He specifically said, "I was looking for something to go and arrest Bam before." He was. He did say that. Those were his exact words. Plus, as well, the constant bombardment of the police by Robert Bofly and Eaton um, that led to an investigation being done by DSI Keneally on the sixth of September, and that report he studied all the evidence that was available and concluded that Sheila was responsible. But the very next day, because the very next day, Robert Bofly threatened to go to the chief constable and complain about the investigation. This was encouraged by DS Jones, even though they then had Keneally's report, which by the way has never been disclosed, but it is spoken about. Ainsley then volunteered himself to lead the investigation. Now, Ainsley later went to work for Robert Bowflower. So it's like, wait a minute, how deep does the corruption go here? You know, we, we all know you've seen programmes where police are taking bribes off people and being paid to, like, not charge people with things. Were they offered money to help and assist in Jeremy being convicted? We don't know. But certainly... The, the media went mad calling the police a Clouseau squad and saying they were inept and, you, yeah. you know, that, that, that they were shocking at investigating. There is no evidence at all that points to anybody other than Sheila committing this atrocity. But, yeah, they, it was a very simple case, murder-suicide, but over the course of time, because of a very few key police officers and a very few key family members, that they spiralled into what it became. And then an innocent man is convicted. Yeah. And I think it, you know, people think, oh, he, he, all the police against him all conspired and all of that thing. It, all you need is a few at the top, as corruption is in the way that police are. The rest just either keep silent because they're scared for their own jobs, I guess, or just go along with it for the same reason. But as well, some of the officers who were at the scene, we've never had their statements. So we know that there was over 77 people at the scene during the morning of 7th of August. As its police have only ever admitted there were 29 people there. Now, the number of statements that we have never had disclosed from firearms officers and people who were at the scene who were involved in that initial siege situation and who went later in the day, They've never been disclosed to us. Well, there's 54 people entered that house in total. We have a fraction of the statements made by those people. We've never seen them. So what were they saying? Why have they been hidden? And of course... There should be no reason, should there, for them to be hidden? Well, exactly. But when somebody's there, if you're a police officer at the scene, you're asked that evening to make a statement of your actions and what you've seen. You make your statement... As far as you're concerned, if you're not involved in that investigation, you move on to the next your next job. So all those police officers who gave statements never been disclosed. They're probably never even aware that we've never got their statements and that that the case against Jeremy was manipulated 
they're probably never not even aware of this. They must think, oh, well, wait a minute, there's some amazing evidence come forward at a later stage that's convicted him. Oh, oh well, we must have been wrong. But yet, yeah. we don't know what they've said originally. We do know that three police officers in the Dickinson inquiry in 1986 actually said that photographs they were shown of the scene weren't to say remember the scene. But, mm. yeah, you know, that's covered up, that's kept quiet. Yeah. Do you think Julie Mugford was aware that the relatives were implicating Jeremy by the time she implicated him after he ended their relationship? I'm sure that there were. There's too many similarities in the evidence in Robert Belfast's diaries, which he wrote on, coincidentally, the 7th of September, 1985. Oh. The same date that Julie Mugford was picked up by the police and taken in. There is just so much that's the same that they couldn't have got independently. So. They both mention the sum of £2,000. They both mention bicycles, window, bathroom and kitchen. They both mention Jeremy's holidays and world cruise. And there is just wetsuit. I mean, there is just so much that's the same. It is not a coincidence. Plus as well, Julie Muckford was asked at court if she'd spoken to Anne Eaton about the position of the Bible because both Anne Eaton and Julie Mugford said that it was on Sheila's chest. So Julie Mugford said that Jeremy had told her it was on Sheila's chest. Anne Eaton said a police officer had said it was on Sheila's chest. So, but obviously that's not where the photographs show it. So they were asked in court if they'd spoken about this and both denied it. Well, in 2002, Stan Jones in his interview to the Metropolitan Police was asked, did Anne Eaton speak to Julie Muckford? And he actually admitted that, yes, they were in contact and that he was there while they were in contact. So we don't know actually when, but it was obviously pre-trial. Yeah. Okay, so next question. If Jeremy is innocent, why did he ask the police to burn blooded items such as sheets and mattresses? Jeremy didn't request that that happen at all. On the evening of the 7th of August, Dan Jones mentioned to Jeremy, do you want us to get rid of these items? And Jeremy said, well, I, I don't know. And he said, and it got him actually to write a handwritten note to authorise the police to do so. So it was Dan Jones who said, we will burn these items, it's carpets, it's the bedding, it's the mattresses, uh, we will burn them for you. And you need to sign this authorisation letter which Jeremy did. I mean, I would do as well. Advice. He didn't know what to do. I, so, I, I mean, if that was, if I was in that, I, I can't imagine being, you know, that position. But if I was, I'd do the same. I would. I wouldn't want to be facing bloodied items, such as you know, that come from my family. Would you? Exactly. But well, can you imagine if it had been the other way around and Jeremy had said to them, "You need to destroy the carpets and the mattresses and the bedding." Well, the police have done it. They've gone, wait a minute, why is he asking us to do that? They'd be keeping it all, wouldn't they? they uh... Exactly. It's the other way around. They actually sought permission off Jeremy to do that. Yeah. So and it's it makes... just yet another myth that's been misinterpreted over the years and it's been actually turned around on its head. It was the police that requested to do it, not Jeremy. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. So we've had this question as recently as just a couple of days ago. Um, it was reported in the media that the tragedies were possibly linked to a drug deal gone wrong and that there were aircrafts dropping drugs at the farm when there were torches hidden in the hedges to guide the planes. Yes. Can you entangle that one? Very true, yes. It's another theory that's been banded about for years and years and years. So firstly, about the low flying aircraft, low flying aircraft were seen in the area of White House Farm. But those, and that was put forward by Roland Partiger, who was Jeremy Bamber's cousin. So he's the brother, no, he's not the brother. He's related to Antony and Jackie Partiger. So he's a, a cousin. 
And as well, other people had reported seeing low-flying aircraft in the area, but actually the low-flying aircraft that they saw were the police in an aircraft taking aerial shots of White House Farm. So that wasn't related to drugs whatsoever. Why were they taking, is this, this is after the tragedies? This is after the tragedies, yeah. This, so this is the police in aircraft uh, taking aerial shots of the farm and the surrounding land just for their records, really, to show the extent of the farm. But that was the police and that is documented. About the torches in the hedges, they did find some torches in the he in hedges. This was supposedly to signal these low flying aircraft where to drop the drugs. Well, no, again, that's all taken out of proportion. There were torches found in the hedgerow. We don't know how long they've been there. They could have been there for years and years and years. But additionally, the police also found an abandoned tent where there'd obviously been people camping over the recent weeks. It is possible the torches belong to them. It's possible they've been there for years. Nobody really knows. There's no explanation for it, but it certainly wasn't connected to any drug strap. I mean, it's, you know, two and two equals five, if ever I've... I've heard it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an elaborate story, it is, it's isn't it? The same it's, with every single aspect. Of I didn't know what to health. say about it. it there's got to be a quicker way to get drugs to a remote farmhouse than uh, a low flying aeroplane guided by some torches in a bush. It's, it's. Well, it's surely a, a low flying aeroplane would have caused attention in the area, well, like yeah. it did, and have reports of low flying aircraft which they did, if you were if you wanting to drop drugs at the farm, wouldn't you quietly go along in your car along the quiet country lane? Pages Lane or whatever it is, stick them in a bush. What? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous story. One of, this one is, of again, the, how things get blown out of all proportion and people then like, take it as fact. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a lot of the questions we've talked about today are just things made up in people's heads that then come out as fact. Yeah, and it's 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 just been made up. It's like the wetsuit, isn't it? Somebody says, well, you know, how are you going to get around the fact that Jeremy didn't have any blood or injuries on him at all? Hmm, let me have a think. How could that possibly have happened? I know, maybe he wore a wetsuit. It's, well, that was actually Robert Bofla that suggested that yeah. in the first place. And the police did seize a wetsuit and test it, and obviously nothing was found on it. So then Robert Bofla then said, oh, but he went on holiday to Eastbourne and washed it in the sea to get rid of the blood. It's, it's just a made-up, you know, story from the depths of his imagination and absolutely nothing more. And then that becomes fact in people oh well that must be how it rather than finding evidence to link him to the crime just make something up that is is really the extent of it and people should be really worried about that and the yeah. fact that, that happens i mean jeremy's case is pure and simple it was a murder suicide there's nothing complex about it very simple case that was concluded on the day over the <laughs> course of the time Every single aspect of Jeremy's case has become more complex and more complex and more complex because of the police changing the situation because of myths that have been put about in the media, myths that have been put about in books and on documentary programmes. It's just, if people would just listen to the facts. Yeah. You know, that's, exactly. that's people that have to agree with everything we say, but we can say to people everything that we say is from official police documentation. So we're not yeah. making it up. We're not speculating. This is the actual truth. Yeah, that's it. If they want to, if they want to opine on the case, actually opine on the facts rather than something they remember that they read about, you know, 10 years ago in a newspaper, that's actually just something that's been made up from the depths okay. of the nation. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to happen, does it, with some people? Sadly not. Yeah. So we hope that's answered some more of your questions and we will be back very soon with um, some more, I'm sure. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Emma. I'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this podcast. 
If you'd like to do something to help Jeremy Bamber, then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamber. And don't forget to share the link with your friends and family. Thank you.